and let's move on. Uh, so we've had a look, really good look at uh, masses on springs. Let's go back to the Benjamin uh, case here. Um, and again, let's break this down as we did with the mass on the end of the spring in terms of what forces are acting on this system. So it's operating in, in precisely the way that we talked about before. We've got um, the length of our piece of string. We've got a displacement from equilibrium and it's simply oscillating backwards and forwards. So we have an angle up here. Uh, in radians, remember we're working in radians because we're thinking in terms of circular motion. Um, so we can break down the forces that are acting on this mass here, and that's essentially what the diagram over on the right hand side of the screen is doing. So if we look at the forces acting here, we've got, uh, what have we got? We've got its weight, so vertically downwards we've got mg, and that's balanced uh, by a tension uh, in the spring, or partially balanced by a tension in the spring. Right? The rest of the force is essentially what's causing the motion. So let's have a look at that in detail. The, the axes that are most useful for us here, uh, one axis is going to run along the string, basically, and the other one, therefore, necessarily is going to be at right angles to that. And right angles to that, you'll notice, is a tangent to the arc of the swing. All right, so we're going to take these as our right angled axes. So that's great because it means the tension in the piece of string lies along one of those axes, but we now need to take uh, mg, the weight of the mass, and resolve that in our um, orthogonal axes here. So we're going to get in this direction, so in line with the tension, we're going to get uh, weight times cosine theta, and in this direction, we're going to get weight times sine theta. All right, now, this mg cos theta is what produces the tension in the string. So those two are precisely balanced. T is equal to mg cos theta. Well, of course it does. It has to, right? Either the string needs to be getting longer, if this is greater than t, or it needs to be wrinkling up and getting shorter <coughs> if the tension is greater than mg cosine theta. It's not, right? Thinking about the swing of a pendulum, uh, everything in that direction is balanced. So t is equal to mg cos theta. It's boring from our perspective. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. The force that's really interesting uh, for us in terms of this oscillation is mg sine theta. Because this is the force, look, that is causing this pendulum bob to move back towards its equilibrium position. And if in your minds uh, you can imagine what happens when the swing is out on you know, this side of the arc, uh, we'll resolve the forces in exactly the same way, but now mg sine theta will actually be pointing back in this direction. So again, towards the equilibrium position. And all we've done is resolve... Um, the um, action of gravity on the mass of the pendulum bob. Alright, so this is sort of summarising what we've got here. So perpendicular to the path, so this is our axis along the string, we've just balanced uh, uh, the tension um, and um, this one here is the one that we're really interested in. So this is the one that's going to give us motion. So the mass of our pendulum bob is being accelerated. Let's call it acceleration A for the sake of consistency. So this force, right, that bit of the resolution of the weight of the mass is going to equal the result of uh, acceleration on the pendulum bob multiplied by its mass. So this is just using F equals MA again. Right, we can obviously cancel mass out either side. And so we're left with that the acceleration on our pendulum bob is just minus g times sine theta. Right, so we're already getting something that looks vaguely like what we've said is the condition for simple harmonic motion. We've already got our minus sign in here. It's already towards the point of equilibrium. 
Uh, what we need to worry about now is this stuff over here, right? G is just a constant, obviously. But does sine theta qualify as telling us that it's proportional to the displacement? Because that's the other condition we need. Well, we can do this easily if we assume that the extent of the swing of our pendulum bob is small. In other words, theta is always small. And in terms of degrees, we're probably talking about you know 10 degrees either side of vertical is okay for this approximation. Um, and if we uh, have you done the small angle approximation in your math modules? You should have done. It's on the syllabus. I'm just checking. But obviously no one remembers it. So you may need to go and just check this out. Uh, but it is the case that it's very simple trigonometry to prove this. If the angle is very small, so you're thinking, basically you're thinking about a right angle triangle where the opposite side of your triangle is tiny compared to either the hypotenuse or the adjacent side. Right? It's a long, thin triangle we're talking about here. Um, if that angle is small, then sine theta approximates to um, just S over L. Sorry, theta approximates to S over L. That is a typo. Sine theta is S over L. But if you write theta in terms of radians, uh, the small angle approximation tells us that theta is approximately equal to S over L. So you may need to correct your notes there. I'll go away and do this myself after the lecture. So if that's true, then we can substitute for sine theta in here, S over L. So we rewrite our equation then, the, the acceleration then is minus G times S over L. In other words, G and L being constants, A is in the direction of uh, restoring our pendulum bob to the point of equilibrium. The minus sign is in there, and it is proportional to the, to the displacement, S. Right, G over L, remember, are just constants. So we can write this in the form that we had as our master equation, as it were, for simple harmonic motion. But now the angular frequency, angular frequency squared, is going to be given by G over L. Yeah? So we have then again a very straightforward equation for the time period of the swing of the pendulum. It's just 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Which is why last week when I was trying to do that demonstration with you with a pendulum and a rotating turntable, the way I controlled or attempted to control uh, the time period of the swing of the pendulum was simply to increase or lengthen the piece of string. Right, so it's this bit in the equation. So the time period depends on the square root of the length uh, of the piece of string. So very, very straightforward. Uh, I don't know if you remember last term in 027, one of the clips, movie clips I showed you, which I forgot to bring down this morning, I'll perhaps bring it down later, uh, was um, from the second parts of the Caribbean film, where they're swinging over the ravine, Right, so basically a pendulum action, and I got you then last term to estimate from looking at this thing on the screen um, what g was, right, from timing it. So in other words, you had a value of t. You estimated what l was by assuming that the cages were about two meters in diameter, if I recall, and so therefore you could scale up to the length of the piece of whatever it was this cage was hanging from. Uh, so by rearranging that equation then you could tell me what G was. And if I recall we got a quite decent value. It wasn't 9.81 but it was pretty good. Yeah? Some recollection of that. That's good. Being able to remember back one term is quite <laughs> quite useful when you consider that your exams are going to be next term. Right? You're going to have to extend that to a two-term memory. Um, okay.
Well, you can use that, of course, then to measure the acceleration due to gravity. And in fact, this was one of the early mechanisms for measuring G. Uh, and how G varied depending on where you were. Um, and that's actually quite, quite important. Uh, so we've got this uh, relationship um, that we've talked about before. Uh, this is really just going through it in a slightly different form, basically in terms of an experiment, right? So we're swinging this mass and measuring times and so on and so forth. Uh, and we've got a very simple relationship, the one I've just produced on the previous slide. So if I square both sides, uh, I end up with something that's relatively straightforward. All right, so I can um, do this as an experiment uh, and look at t squared against um, uh, displacement. Or I can actually look at t squared against the length of the pendulum, which is actually what's in this uh, graph down here. Um, and it gives me a, um, a gradient. Right, and the gradient of that curve, given that we know uh, that we've got this relationship up here, the gradient of that curve is going to be 4 pi squared over G. So we can measure G from an experiment like that. And if you do it properly, if you do it accurately, uh, you can actually get a really good value. You'll notice that it does go through the origin. Right? This graph has to go through the origin. If you reduce the length ultimately to zero, then the time period will be zero for the swing. All right, so that's something you should expect. Uh, and G does vary. G varies a lot depending on where you are on the Earth's surface. This is not stuff you need to remember. I've thrown this in just for interest's sake. But roughly where we are, it's about 9.81. Uh, but if you go to the equator, uh, it goes down. If you go up to the poles, it goes up. Uh, anyone think of a reasonable explanation for why that should be true? It's not a perfect sphere. Because the Earth isn't a sphere. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what we would call an oblate spheroid. So it's, it's basically it's spinning <coughs> out its middle and necessarily therefore squashing the poles. So you're closer to the centre of the Earth than the poles. That's essentially what it's saying. And further away from the centre of the Earth than the equator. Right, so G varies accordingly. Um, but it also depends where you are in terms of altitude. So actually you can go to the top of a mountain and measure a change in G uh, as well. Um, there is a rough equation. This is, you know, that includes latitude and altitude. Um, and it's not a bad equation, it's not perfect, but it's, it'll give you roughly what G is going to be at any point on the Earth's surface, if you know those two things. Um, but it does vary a lot. This is actually quite a neat little picky, which I will show you, assuming it works, it should do. Um, but that's a colour-coded gravity map, essentially, of, of the Earth's surface. Right, so it's relatively high at the poles, it's relatively <coughs> low at the equator, but then it depends, again, it depends on the precise detailing then of the surface, so you know, deep oceans, land masses, high mountains, all that sort of stuff. Uh, an interesting question. Something to amaze your friends with, that you could work out the length of a pension required <laughs> to keep in phase with the London eye. Um, maybe not. Uh, okay, so we've talked so far about acceleration and we've talked about forces. Okay, so now let's complete the mix and we're talking about energy in superharmonic motion. This is quite an important topic. It's not going to take more than two or three sides to finish. Uh, it's not a complicated topic, but it's an important thing to finish off this aspect uh, of the module. Um, now, we're going to... Uh, be talking in this instance about free oscillations and what that means is that there are no frictional forces. So this is definitely an idealized system and we've been talking about idealized systems from the very beginning of this part of, of the syllabus. Okay, And I mentioned early on uh, 
that we're going to ignore things like friction. Okay, so we were assuming that our amplitude of swing or of oscillation, whatever it is, is going to be the same for all time. Right? And evidently it's not. If you don't put energy into a system uh, when there are frictional forces, then uh, it's going to slow down. So the amplitude will slowly decrease until uh, it comes to rest. All right? Okay. <coughs> Um, all right, now, in, in, just take the pendulum oscillation as an example. We've got something that's exchanging energy between kinetic forms and potential forms as it goes through the swing. So when it's at the bottom of the swing, so going through the equilibrium position, at that point, the potential energy is at its minimum. Guys, do you think we can keep focused on what we're actually doing? Uh, the potential energy is going to be at a minimum. But the kinetic energy, this is the point, remember, at which the velocity is maximum. The kinetic energy is therefore maximum at that point. All right? And conversely, when we're at the uh, uh, end points of our swing, we're momentarily going through um, a velocity of zero. All right? It comes to rest momentarily before it starts moving back down again. So necessarily at that point, our kinetic energy is also zero. But it's the point of maximum kinetic energy. Now we've got all of this height that our mass can drop under the influence of, of gravity uh, being accelerated all the time. All right, so we go from... Sorry, we've got to ask something. Oh, I thought I heard you say something. I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, so we go from maximum kinetic energy at the point of equilibrium, minimum potential energy, to the obverse of that when we're at the uh, extent of the, of the swings. And we can plot that graphically, obviously, in a fairly uh, um, straightforward way. If I look at the energy of our, uh, uh, of our pendulum, so the mass in the pendulum, basically, uh, we've got kinetic energy that's maximum in the centre, potential energy that's maximum at the amplitude of the swing, either side. All right, so we can work out what our kinetic energy is going to be. That's pretty trivial. We've actually just done that calculation uh, in the previous lecture. It relies on this equation up here where the displacement is going to be zero. Right? We're passing through the point of equilibrium, remember. Um, so the potential, uh, sorry, the maximum in our um, kinetic energy is therefore just given by half m omega squared times r. r in the case of a pendulum is just the length of the piece of string. Um, sorry, the amplitude of the string. Um, and for an oscillating mass on a spring, similarly, we've got from the equations we had before uh, that the kinetic energy is a half k r squared minus s squared, and s again in this case is going to be zero. All right, now we're going to do a somewhat more simplistic argument for potential energy uh, because uh, if we look at the restoring force, uh, then I'm going to take basically and we're going to take an average, right, between um, S being zero and S being at the amplitude. So the average force then is going to, I'm going to write down as a half Ks. So the average force. Uh, sorry, the average uh, energy expended is going to be the force times the distance over which that force is applied. We've used this equation many, many times. We used it when we were defining the electron volt last term, if you remember. Um, so I'm going to get half K S squared as my potential energy. So here's the kinetic energy, wherever it is up here. Here's the potential energy. Um, and all I need now to do to get the total energy is just add them together. Okay, which is essentially what's happening on the top of this slide. So if we add them together, we get half k r squared. All right? well, I've just done it in the case of the spring in this case. You can do it for the pendulum as well. It can come out to be comparable. And these numbers are all constants. So that's just telling us that the total energy is constant, which is what you would expect in the absence of... Uh, um, anything else happening, right? We're not converting any of it to mass. It is just a constant energy. 
Why doesn't altitude affect the energy in either, either system? It does. Right, because the time period will change, etc., etc. Right, so the total energy of the system is going to be different because the force acting on the mass due to gravity is different. Mg is different because g is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at that altitude, the total energy of your oscillating system is constant. Right, the total energy goes up when you take it down to sea level, but still one swing to the next swing and all the, way th all the way through the swing, the total energy is going to be the same. It's a different total energy, but it is constant. So if I substitute from what we've had earlier, a few slides back, for K uh, in our more generic form, so I'm going to stick uh, uh, M omega uh, squared back in there again, then I have this generic equation for any system in simple harmonic motion. The total energy is half uh, uh, half m omega squared times the square of the amplitude, whatever that amplitude is. Okay, so that's our third key equation, if you like. Remember, simple harmonic motion is defined on the basis of acceleration. Out of that, we considered force and again now we've considered energy, but the basic definition, remember, is, is written in terms of acceleration. So that's the key equation we have to remember. Okay, now, if we've got... Um, the last bit, really, is to move us into, the, into a, a, a more realistic view of the world. So we've got oscillating systems that in general have some sort of restoring force. We've been talking about that endlessly in terms of forces trying to move uh, a system back to its equilibrium position. Uh, but it's also got inertia. That's actually what carries it through the equilibrium to the other side of the swing or the other side of the oscillation, for instance. Uh, and that's associated with the system's kinetic energy. Uh, but of course, in, in reality, we've also got frictional forces. We've got damping dissipative forces, some textbooks will describe it as. Uh, and that eventually is going to convert the energy of our system into heat, right? which is what friction does. So in the case of the swing of our pendulum, it typically will have air uh, friction forces. So the pendulum is going to be heating up the air around it as it slices through in its swing. Also, actually, there will be frictional forces at the fulcrum point, so where the piece of string or wire is attached to a fixed point. We're causing that to, to flex, right, periodically. There will be frictional forces due to that as well. So we've got these damping forces in action. 